Hello, today I'd like to talk about three-dimensional fatigue and shaft design. I'd like to go through my tweaks on the example 7.2 that's in the Shigley book. First of all, we want to introduce uh, distortion energy Goodman as our three-dimensional uh, theory for fatigue. We want to look at uh, how we calculate our endurance strength and how we get our fatigue stress concentration factors, KF and KFS. We want to look at our shaft critical locations. We want to look at uh, what the impact of shoulders, keys, and snap rings are. The main thing is we want to be able to design the shaft diameters. So, modified Goodman versus distortion energy Goodman. If you remember your one-dimensional modified Goodman, we just simply had um, the reciprocal relation for fatigue factor of safety, and it was related to some alternating stress and a mid-range stress um, as they sat relative to their endurance strength and the ultimate tensile strength. The three-dimensional version of it is very simply just providing or using von Mises equivalents for the alternating part and the mid-range part. So that's the only difference. Remember from Chapter 5, von Mises was first given in terms of the principal stresses. And then it was given in terms of the stress, the original stress components. And what we're actually going to be using would be when it's given in terms of plane stress components, when you have a plane stress type of situation. As a matter of fact, uh, we're going to only have a sigma x and a tau xy. So we're going to be using this implementation because our sigma y is generally our zero. We're going to have a bending for our sigma x, and then we're going to have a tau xy um, from torsion. So we're going to be running with the distortion energy Goodman, and we're going to be talking about an alternating von Mises stress, and we're going to be talking about a mid-range all, uh, von Mises stress. So it's pretty straightforward that the alternating von Mises is going to have an alternating bending stress. That's what this is. And then an alternating torsional stress. And that's what this is. So this is predicated on you having a round shaft of diameter D. It's predicated on you having a bending moment that's alternating, that's given, a torque that's alternating and given. It's predicated on you having a fatigue stress concentration factor, KF, and a fatigue stress concentration factor, KFS. So those are the pieces that go into the alternating von Mises. The mid-range versions of those are really just the same thing. It's just that you have the alternate, I'm sorry, you have the mid-range bending moment and then you have the mid-range torque. So it's just a little bit of some bookkeeping and sort of keeping track of what the physical significance would be of the various loads. So you get things put into the right place. Once you have the alternating von Mises stress and the mid-range von Mises stress, then you can put it into your distortion energy Goodman. And once you make that substitution, put all these pieces in there, you can actually expand this out to have this humongous equation here where you've got one over the factor of safety. And you can actually pull out a 16 over pi d cubed. So that's important to be able to factor that out. And this leaves a whole lot of things inside the square root brackets. So 
So if I took that previous equation that I had and I swapped d cubed to the left hand side and put n over on the right hand side, look what I get. Um, I get the ability to take all that quantity and do the cubed root of it. And I have an, I have a, actually have an equation for d for diameter. Um, so this is sort of this is what the book shows is getting a good starting point for what your diameter might be. So this is what we're going to use. Let's see what we know. Well, you would use for the end, you would use your design factor. So you have that piece coming in. Um, you would need to know the mid-range, I'm sorry, the bending moment that's alternating, the torque that's alternating, the mid-range bending moment, and the torque this mid-range. You would have to know that from the problem statement, the way the shaft is laid out and how the loads are, are coming from the various things that touch it, your shaft. So you'd have to know those. Um, you would have to propose a material. Remember that uh, you, don't, you can't be scared to propose a material. So you have to do that. Um, the SE, you get the specimen version of this SU, uh, using SUT, but the SE actually depends on geometry as well and also how it's uh, finished, this, the shaft. Um, the KF, KF, KFS, KFS, that depends on geometry, but you really don't know those yet. So how in the world can you solve for diameter if you don't know the geometry? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to go through and show you how to do it. And here's our example 7.2 that does it. In this example, which is taken from the Shigley book, Chapter 7, we're going to repeat it um, with some slight tweaks. We're going to use 2 for the design factor. We're going to use a 332nd of an inch for the shoulder radius. And we're going to use 132nd of an inch where we have our bearing. Uh, so some standard uh, radii there. And then uh, for the snap ring uh, areas, we're going to actually go and pick uh, some snap rings from McMaster. We're going to also talk about uh, some keyway stuff. So um, these are this is the shaft layout um, that would actually be given. The X layout would be given. You would know that. You would know. You need to know that because you would need to know um, what the forces are coming from the gears. So there's some gears here. There's gear three and gear four. This is basically a counter shaft. This is a counter shaft because there's power coming in. Gear three is a bigger gear. So power is coming into gear three. Gear four is powering something else from another gear. So that's what this is. And these are your bearings. And they sort of labeled some diameters, but those diameters are not known yet. That's what we're going to do. We're going to figure out the diameters um, based on what the loads are. So uh, here are the loads. So you get a better idea of what the uh, of what the gears would look like here. They don't show a lot of them, um, but they do show the shaft sort of um, big in the middle and then tapered on the ends. Uh, I'm not, not tapered, but stepped for uh, accepting the bores of the particular gears. And they've, they've given you some of the loads here that we're going to rely on. And they show keys between points G and, and J. And they show there's a torque diagram there which shows what the torque intensity is between those two locations. And then um, this is sort of a tough one for some students to appreciate. But because of how the loads are, uh, the XY plane has loads and the ZX plane also has loads because of what's happening 
at the gear teeth, which you know from dealing with the spur, uh, spur gear train free body diagrams. So from those loads and, and these loads at those particular gears, you're going to have reaction loads in both planes. And because of that, you're going to have shear and bending moment diagrams in both of those planes. And it becomes a matter of figuring out what the resultant bending moment is that we have here. So you basically take that bending moment for the ZX plane and combine it with this bending moment for the XY plane. You get a resultant just from taking the sum of squares and then square rooting it. And as I was saying before, um, the smaller gear of course would be your output. So that's where the bending moments are actually the highest. Um, if you can appreciate that. So if you think it think of it in terms of critical locations, um, remember where you have torque, and it looks like they're going to say, "Hey, we've got a steady, we've got a, a, a steady mid-range torque." What we're having, and we've got an alternating um, moment. The reason it's alternating is because the shaft is rotating. Rotating shaft means that this. Um, this bending moment here will, is what really the case is applying to the shaft. So the shaft would see that particular bending moment alternating uh, as it rotated. But, uh, but this torque is always going to be active between G and J, and they're saying that it's a steady version of it. And again, this has been flashing up. The X, this X layout would have to be done for you to have this uh, bending moment diagram and torque diagram. So we're going to proceed with uh, figuring out what these diameters needs to be and of course we're going to focus on the critical locations um, that are going to be where the loads are high. I, J will be your two big places there because you're going to have torque in both places. You're going to have high bending moment Bending moment in both places. Okay, so we're going to rework this example 7 2 um, based on a 2.0 design factor. We're going to start at the shoulder. That's where the, where the uh, book started, and we're going to start with the same place. We're going to start with the same modest uh, steel, the 1020 cold drawn. SUT of 68. Um, we need to know how it's how it, what the surface finish is. So it's going to be just uh, plain machined, not ground. So we're going to be picking up um, these pieces here in order to figure out what our Marin factor is for surface finish. So that we could actually get that squared away. Um, for the size factor, a size depends on the diameter, which we don't know, as we said. So we're going to estimate it with a 0.9. We know it's not going to be the same as the specimen. Uh, it's going to be bigger than 0.3. So we're going to uh, estimate it with a 0.9, and we're going to set the other Marins to 1. So that gives us a, a preliminary um, endurance strength that we can roll with. We take the we take the specimen endurance and then we modify it based on the Marin factors that we know or estimates. Okay, um, so for the fatigue strength concentration factors, those are labeled in chapter seven as KF and KFS. It's also in chapter six at the end. Um, and we, since we don't know the geometry, we have to have a way to start. So the book gives us a table 7-1. Really take a moment to examine this particular table. So it's table 7-1. First iteration estimates for stress concentration factors, KT and KTS. Warning, these factors are only estimates for use when actual dimensions are not known. Do not use these once you have your dimensions. And sometimes uh, 
uh, sometimes it gives us a good starting point. So uh, right now we're looking at a uh, shoulder fillet for our point I. Um, it's a well-rounded shoulder fillet is what we're assuming. And that's given us the ability to start with KT as 1.7 and KTS as 1.5. So that's the row that we're starting with right now. There's other uh, parts like we'll have to use the uh, key seat, in mill key seat later on. We'll start with that, or uh, we may have to start with a snap ring groove. We have to, may have to use that, um, but these are very helpful from time to time. Um, oh, for the other thing is uh, we're going to delve into how you get your KF from your KT in just a moment, but for now we're going to allow them to be equal. So uh, we're going to review our equation 7-8 which was that cubic equation that we had earlier. Um, it greatly simplifies, and this is a lot of times the case quite frankly, that our mid-range moment is going to be zero. So that's going to drop out of that. We're only going to have a, a steady mid-range torque so that stays in and then over here our alternating torque is zero so that goes away we have this alternating bend, uh, bending moment that stays in there so um, and then that simplifies this term so this part here comes down as just that and then this part here comes down as just that so it great, greatly simplifies it and we have um, these other pieces. We, we just discuss, uh, discussed what the KF would be, 1.7. Then we discussed what the KFS is, 1.5. Let's see where we get the alternating and bending moment and where we get the mid-range uh, torque. Let's go back and check those out. Okay, so for point... I, it's right there. So we're going to use 3651 inch pounds for our bending moment. And we're going to use 3240 for our torque. So that's what goes here, and that's what goes there. SUT because of the 1020 cold drawn. Right here, 68. Goes there. Um, the SE was this bit that we calculated earlier from our estimate of KB um, and the proposed SUT of 68. That's how we got our SE of 27 KPSI. Uh, so anyway, we turn the crank, um, put all those numbers in, and we get uh, 1.811. We're not going to roll with that dimension. We're going to move it up to a standard dimension. Some students, um, I put a note here about perhaps the next smaller dimension will work. Maybe we go to two inches. Um, and the students are sometimes very uneasy about this. Well, dang, you could go and check some different diameters. It's not overwhelming. So uh, anyway, in, in this presentation, we're going to hopefully stick with the 1 and 7 eighths inch. So that is for now what I have as, at the shoulder location <coughs> I. So this D is the D5 from the original uh, figure, the lowercase d, because I'm looking at the shoulder at I. So uh, when we go look at the graphs, figure A15s, forget our stress concentration factors, the capital D is going to be the D4. So it's very important that you don't get confused and you're able to do substitution of variables. So we're going to have a, we're going to try to use a D over D of 1.2 and I've got a, Another little cheater for that to explain why 
but uh, but basically you need a shoulder there because that's where the gear is going to be setting against you don't want a super high uh, D to D capital D to lowercase D because that just shoves your KT up you, you don't want a lower really small D because well heck that then you, you don't have a D you don't have a shoulder so uh, this is kind of a sweet spot the 1.2 so generally speaking that's why they recommend this um, and then if we know the fillet radius there 3 32nd of an inch then we know our R over D um, so based on the D over D and the R over D um, we can go through and pick up our KT and KTS so let's check one out here if I have a 0.05 and I'm going to come up to roughly a 1.2. That's going to be between these two. So what it's telling me is my KT is going to be 2. And that's what I had. Let's go check out the next one. KTS uh, for 0.05. And then I've got to actually have a 1.2 there. Um, looks like it's right at 1.6. So I, I, I took the 1.6. Um, now, to get from your KT and your KF and then also your KTS and your KFS, we need to use equation 632. So um, that's going to be something new for you. It's a little bit quirky, but it's from the notch sensitivity chart. This is for the Q. This is for KT and KT, the Q and KF go together. That's the normal. And then the shear version, you have a QS or a Q shear that goes with the KTS and that gives you the KFS. Um, so you need to, and this is not R over D, this is actually R. So you have to be careful there. Um, and what I had shown you here is, let's take a look at the, the uh, KT and KF, the first one. So we had uh, 0.09-ish, 0.93, uh, 30, 332 of an inch. And then we're going to come up to a 68. So we're going to be right in there, and I've declared it as 0.75 for Q. So we're going to be right in there. We're going to pick up a 0.75 for Q. And then what it does is it just kind of softens the Q, the notch sensitivity, kind of just softens the original KT and makes it a little bit less. So that's the idea behind it. Um, anyway, so you need the notch radius. In inches, you have it millimeters. You come from the top, but uh, then you have these um, ultimate strength, a family of curves there that you've got to navigate as well. And then the QS, Q shear, same thing. You're going to come up here a little bit above that. I've shown it as 0.8. I could believe it. And then uh, we had our original KTS as 1.6. So puts it down to a little bit less 1.48 so that's how you get your fatigue stress concentration factors from your KT so you need the KTs KT KTS you need the particular material you're using and you also need to know the notch radius so um, also um, I revised the size uh, Marin, the Marin size factor based on the new um, proposed diameter 1.875 and that's given me uh, 0.822 then I revised the SE based on the SUT of 68 and the previous KA that I had so I revised that so remember this this comes from the equation 620 um, and of course your endurance strength comes from stacking up your Marin factors and then your um, specimen endurance limit
which is half of your SUT. Okay, so now I, I'm ready to go calculate my new, my actual fatigue factor safety. And I put in all my pieces. I put in, you know, figuring out what my alternating von Mises is. I put in my KF. I put in my alternating bending moment. I put in my proposed diameter. Turn the crank. I get my PSI. And then for my mid-range von Mises stress, I put in my KFS, my TM, um, my steady. That's my steady torque. Then I have my diameter, turn the crank, there we go. So then I put in um, into my distortion energy Goodman equation. I put in my various pieces and invert it. And boy, I'm just over this marginally acceptable, uh, just right over to. So this comes from that distortion energy Goodman. So we've, we've only checked the shoulder. We've got other things to do. Uh, oh, of course, I checked the Langer. So this would be the Langer version of it. So you do the von Mises over the yield strengths check your, to check your uh, Langer. So we're good there. So uh, here I'm going to go look at the diameter at the end of the keyway. So this is just to the right of point I. So there it's saying the alternating bending moment is 3750. I'm going to go back to the original drawing here. Take a look at that. Let's look at the original. So we're going to be under load at, at J. So it's going to be just to the left of J where the keyway starts. So we're going to have a torque. Um, so the 3750 is going to be just to the left of point I. I'm sorry, just to the right of point I and just to the left of point J where the key would start. So picking back up here, just to the right of point I, where that uh, 3750 is, um, we're going to start with that table 7-1. We're going to start with that 2.4 for our KT. Let's go take a look at the table 7-1 again, where we're going to uh, get a beginning estimate for our KT and KTS. So here's our 7 1 right here. Okay, so we're going to look at this end mill seat. So that 0.02 is actually a pretty sharp fillet radius based on the diameter, pretty sharp. So uh, bending wise, 2.14 and torsional 3. So that's where we're picking up with back and forth here a little bit. So, okay. Um, yeah, so that's given us our R. Uh, we've got our KT from table 7.1 I've just shown you. And then we're going to get our Q and our QS based on what that R would be from our figures 6.20 and 6.21. So we're going to be able to calculate KF and KFS using that method I showed you based on those figures. For the keyway, putting in our MA load and then putting in our KF, putting in our diameter, we can get our alternating von Mises stress. Putting in our KFS, putting in our steady torque, and putting in our diameter, we can get our mid range von Mises stress. Then we can use the reciprocal or the distortion energy Goodman. To calculate our reciprocal factor of safety, fatigue factor of safety, and it's actually going to end up with a factor of safety that's less than two, so that's not acceptable. So we have a couple of ways we can go. 
we could up our diameter or we could go to a stronger steel so um, when you can go to a stronger steel maybe that's the way to go so we try to change over to a 1050 cool drawn so that would be uh, 100 kpsi it's a good time to kind of highlight the process that i recommend for shaft design and this is what i'm doing here with you now um, we propose a material we have our design factor we calculate our diameter using that cubed root, e cubed root equation and of course you go to a standard size and part and parcel of getting this cubed root equation you have to make some first uh, iteration estimates I showed you how to do that and then based on that standard size you can revise things and you can calculate your actual factors of safety for fatigue and also the langer for cycle and if your fatigue factor and langer are both higher than your design factor, then you're good. Um, otherwise, you have to make a change. You either change the geometry or you go to a stronger material. In this example, I've gone to a stronger material. So um, I'm going to recalculate um, the things that are affected by the ultimate tensile strength. The first one, remember, is your surface. Your surface Marin factor is going to change. Um, and of course, your specimen is going to change as well. So that gets our endurance actually will come up a little bit to 32. Uh, our Q's are going to change, so that's going to affect our KF's and our KFS. So you're going to change your Q's, you're going to change your KF and KFS, and then you're going to revise your alternating von Mises and your mid-range uh, von Mises stresses. So uh, they're going to change, and that's going to have the following effect once we plug that in. Plug in our new SUT, plug in our new SE, and our new stresses. We end up with an acceptable uh, fatigue factor safety there. Um, yeah, so anyway, I wanted to pause for a moment and talk a little bit about the keyways. So this is not the factor safety for the keys, but this is actually the factor safety for the geometry and the stress concentration that happens because you've, you've cut a slot into the shaft to put this key. The one that we just used is a sharp key that looks like this, and that sharp key would go into a pretty much a sharp hole unless it's at the end of the shaft, and then you might be able to use a sled running key seat, which has this nice smooth uh, end on it. So that's one thing you can do. That lowers the bending um, KT. And how I uh, recommend doing uh, these things is I recommend using a different kind of key, actually a Woodruff key, which is sort of giving you that nice smooth in each direction. The sled runner is just in the one direction, but this one actually gives it to you in both directions, a nice uh, uh, softer radius there. And I say, well, in that case, I'm going to allow you to use the shoulder fillet well-rounded so the 1.7 and the 1.5 instead of the 2.14 and the 3 for your KT and your KTS. So that's what I recommend. Then I went through and said, well, um, here, this first part here, that's the sharp keyway for the 2.14 and the 3 that we just did. And I've put in the numerical examples um, th these are the things that you need to calculate. Um, we got the 2.25 or 2.26 example just a moment ago based on, it's predicated on using a sharp keyway. Had this not been okay, we could have actually, in, a, in addition to having the choice of material, uh, change in material, change in geometry, we could have also changed the keyway. Um, 
which is sort of geometry, go to that softer, round, well-rounded uh, connection of the woodruff. So instead of using the 2.14 and the 3, I'm switching over to the 1.7 and the 1.5. That's the only difference, and it does propagate some differences uh, here for um, the KF and the KFS. There's some changes for Q, QS as well. Um, but our factor of safety goes up considerably just because of that change of key. So that's that's a good one to keep in mind. So now uh, next we're going to go check the groove, the snap ring groove at location K. Okay, I'm going to go back and look at what that means to position K. See what's going on at K. So I have to go all the way back to the beginning. K. So K is going to be on the outside of the gear. So there's no torque out there. So this is only going to be bending. It's 2398 for bending. And that's, of course, alternating bending 2398 at K. No torque. Alternating moment 29 or 2398. Yeah, here we go. Alternating bending moment 2398. Um, so this is a flat bottom place where we're putting a groove, uh, and it's saying to use KF K equals KT of 5 from table 7.1. Let's go back and look at table 7-1. Oh, there's one right there. So table 7-1 is saying uh, retaining ring groove is using 5 for bending. That's huge. The 5 for bending is huge. All right, so I put in, um, I have my SE from my stronger material. I've got my diameter saying here to use 1. And I use the example out of the book. It says you use uh, 1 and 8, 7, 5. You know, the diameter of the groove is actually smaller than that. Anyway, um, and then I've got the 32. Um, this is just substituting for sigma A prime. The 5 is the KT. And then the 2398 would be your bending moment. So that's the KT right there. Um, anyway, so this is 1.77. That is, that's too low because we wanted two in this example or this problem. So that's a little low. But that five is really what's causing this. So I had the idea, you know what, I'm going to go and find an actual snap ring and pull in its actual dimensions to use the KT. So I went to McMaster Car, and I'll show you a picture of this in a second. But the groove width is um, 068 or 68 mil, and the groove depth is 53 mil. Um, so based on the groove depth, I end up with 1875 minus two of those depths. It gets me to 1769. Then I need to go look at um these uh a15 drawings a15 16 so that's for a flat bottom we'll go peek, peek at those in a second um, let's take a look at the snap ring here's the snap ring that i pulled off of mcmaster so it just snaps around there's a groove you put in there and it snaps in there it's a nice clean way of going It'll take a little bit of thrust load, but not a lot, but it's mainly to keep things from walking out on you. So you got a groove width of 068 and a depth of 53 mils. So those are your two critical things um, that we use in the graph. And in our calculations, we'll use the 1.769. Um, so here's our flat bottom groove. So we, you know, of course, worried about R, but A is going to be our groove width. 
and then it shows this as T. That's our T. So our T is 53 and our A is 68. So what we need is our A over T and then we need our R over T. So let me go back and peek at what that was. Um, so R over T, I'm going to use 0.2. And then my A over T is about one and a quarter, 68 or 53. So let's go see. So 0.2 and 1.28. So 0.2, so that's, you want to keep it low. We're going to go with 0.2. And then 1.28, somewhere in there. So that'd be four and a half, so I'm going to call it uh, 4.3, 4 4.3 for my KT. All right, so there's my KT. Um, I need the R. I use the 0.2 to get my R because I need to go back and fix my Q, get my Q from figure 620, I end up with a KF of 3.15 once I incorporate the Q, just show, show you what that is. Remember the equation to get your KF, it relates the Q from figure 620 and the KT from the, the appropriate figure of A15. So we got the 4.3 from that, and we got the 0.65 from our figure 620. So our KF, our fatigue stress concentration factor, 3.15. And then, of course, our alternating von Mises stress is 32 KF MA over pi D cubed. Um, so that goes in the denominator here. And for the groove, I'm going to use the D for the groove, which is 1.769. And so I have that squared away. Um, here's my SE. So I put all the pieces in here, and I turn the crank, and I get 2.36. So it's just a matter of picking that snap ring, in this case, the actual snap ring, so that I could get real dimensions and not estimates from that table 7-1. Okay. Um, so here is seeing check the belt bearing shoulder at um, MA. Let's see what that is, the bearing shoulder. And remember we did from the beginning of the problem have a small radius there for that bearing. Let's go look at where that 959 is. So the 959, that's going to be at the shoulder. So that's going to be M there. Don't really have an M shown here. I've got a 2398. 2398 goes to the center of the bearing. From there, it goes to zero at the center of the bearing. How do they get 959? Huh. So between K, K I've got 2398, and then at the middle of the bearing I've got zero. So from K, I want to know M. So, um, and then at B I've got zero. So 2398 there, zero there. What do I have at M? Hmm, so that looks like uh, 0.5 from M to B, and then 1.25 from K to B. Let's see. Um, equals 0.5 divided by 1.25. So a fraction of that 2398. Hey, 959. Interesting. So that's where they get the 959. That's where they get that from. 
So somewhere in here, that's where our M is. So that's that bearing shoulder. Let's get back to this. This is very, very back and a lot of back and forth on these things. Okay. So bearing shoulder 959. Um, so then I just make some assumptions and I've done this process a few times, so you guys should be able to follow it. You know, you're basically um, you're basically going to have a D over D. Um, you're going to have an R over D. You're, you're going to go get your KT. Um, there's no KTS because this is only bending moment. There's no steady torque out here at the bearing. Um, we have our SE. We have our proposed diameter for the bearing. And we get our KF from the process I've just discussed. So then we get our final fatigue factor safety. So, um, so the original figure, uh, we just reflect them over to the other side. So we pretty much have all of our diameters, um, our 225, our 1875 and then I think there's that final diameter that would occur out there 1.125 1 1 1.35 1 1.875 and 2.25 let's go back and take a look at the first picture So this one is a good picture. So this diameter, the biggest diameter is 2.25. This diameter is 1.875, and they said we'll just reflect it there. Um, and then this diameter is 1 and an eighth, and they use 1.2 again here, so that's 1.35. So you basically have all of the diameters in this particular design. And that's using the 1050 cold drawn. Okay, so um, in my chapter 7 additional notes that you might find, it gives you some guidance on certain things. I plucked these out of chapter 7. And... Um, you know, you can really look at the stress concentration figures in um, figure A15 and really get a good idea of why these things are recommended like this. Um, I told you about the 1.2 D over D for shoulders. This was one I used earlier uh, for the flat bottom. You go take a quick peek at that one. Well, there it is there. I mean, I want to use the lowest one that goes all the way across. So that is your R over T. I mean, why would I want to use this one that really jumps up? So, you you know, these figures really guide you on design. Um, that uh, tells you what to use for the various stress concentrations. Keyway, I kind of showed you that the Woodruff uh, gives you a nice opportunity there. In summary, uh, we've shown you how to use DE Goodman, Distortion Energy Goodman, to design shafts and to do 3D fatigue analysis. We showed you an iterative recommended method for shaft design. Uh, we highlighted and focused on some critical locations to size the shaft properly. Um, we talked about uh, integrating the shaft components, at least on the shaft, part of it, the shoulders, the keys, and the snapped rings, and we gave a couple of guiding points for how to design, how to keep your stress stresses low, and really, quite frankly, it is a matter of using the stress concentration figures to guide you. Um, obviously, smooth is better, and that's all for today. I hope you've enjoyed it.